welcome to Notable Nobels, a podcast about the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine. My name is Harrison Doolin. I am a PhD candidate at the University of California, Riverside, and I will be your host for this web series. The purpose of this series is to trace key advancements made in the biological and medical sciences over the past 120 years or so, and we're using the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine as a guide. Now, every career has its highest prize, and the highest prize for a scientist is the Nobel Prize. It's the most prestigious award a scientist can receive, and it marks discoveries that have made a profound impact on our understanding of biology and our ability to treat diseases. Today, we will be examining the 1948 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, which was awarded to Paul Hermann Mueller. The Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute chose to give Mueller the award, quote, for his discovery of the high efficacy of DDT as a contact poison against several arthropods, unquote. We'll be going over how DDT was used to control the spread of insect-borne diseases, how concerns were later raised about the overuse of DDT and its effect on the environment, and we'll end by going over some cool new ways scientists have found to prevent insects from spreading diseases. But first, a little bit about Mueller. Paul Mueller was born right at the end of the 19th century in 1899 in Switzerland. He ended up dropping out of high school in 1916 to become a lab assistant at a chemical company. He spent two years in industrial chemical labs, during which time he developed an interest in pursuing a deeper understanding of chemistry. He returned to high school in 1918, and after graduating, he enrolled in the University of Basel. He stayed at Basel after earning his undergraduate degree and completed his PhD in chemistry in 1925. He then got a job at a company called Geige, a large dye company that is currently incorporated into the company Novartis. This company made a variety of natural plant-based dyes, and they were looking for ways to protect their plants from insects. Mueller was assigned to the development of insecticides for the company. He was specifically looking for an insecticide that would satisfy the following seven conditions. Number one, great insect toxicity. Number two, rapid onset of toxic action. Number three, little or no mammalian or plant toxicity. Number four, no irritant effect or no or only a faint odor. Number five, and we'll come back to this one later, the range of action should be as wide as possible and cover as many arthropods as possible. And number six, which we'll also come back to later, long persistent action, i.e. good chemical stability. Finally, number seven, low price. It should be economically feasible. So like many other scientists before him, the search for a chemical that would satisfy all of these requirements would be a long process of trial and error. Mueller tested hundreds of compounds without result before turning his attention to a group of chemicals called the chlorinated hydrocarbons. One chemical from this group of molecules had been shown to be somewhat toxic to moths, so Mueller began synthesizing other chlorinated hydrocarbons to see if any might suit his purposes. In 1939, he ended up with a molecule called dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, which thankfully we abbreviate to DDT. DDT, in Mueller's words, quote, showed a strong insecticidal contact action such as I had to date never observed in any substance, unquote. Here's how he described it. Quote, my fly cage was so toxic after a short period that even after very thorough cleaning of the cage, untreated flies on touching the walls fell to the floor. I could carry on my trials only after dismantling the cage, having it thoroughly cleaned, and after that leaving it for about one month in the open air." Unquote. So DDT was clearly something new, something special in the pesticide industry. Not only was it very toxic to the insects, but insects would die after simply touching the stuff, as opposed to a poison that worked only after being ingested or inhaled. And it was so stable. I mean leaving the cage out for one month in between experiments, that is one potent poison. 
Mueller and his Swiss colleagues tested DDT in a field trial in 1939 against the Colorado potato beetle, which, as you might have guessed, destroys potato crops. They found DDT to be an incredibly effective contact poison against the beetle, without any observed negative effects on the plants or on the farm workers who handled the crops. DDT was patented in Europe in 1940, and later also in the US, and it came into worldwide use as a crop insecticide in the mid-1940s. Now at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, Okay, that's cool, I guess, that Mueller was able to make a great insecticide and protect people's crops or whatever, but isn't this a podcast about the Nobel Prize in medicine? What on earth does an agricultural chemist like Mueller, who was working with flies, have to do with human diseases? Well, that's a great question. And here's the connection. It quickly became apparent that DDT was highly effective at killing insect vectors of human diseases. Insects and other arthropods are major causes of human disease, from the tsetse fly that transmits African sleeping sickness parasites, to the lice that transmit typhus, to the mosquitoes that transmit a whole bunch of things, including Zika, Dengue, Yellow Fever virus, West Nile virus, and of course, malaria. Over a million people were dying globally every year in the 1930s from insect-borne diseases. So when word got around that there was a new, highly potent chemical insecticide, it piqued people's interest. Specifically, DDT became of interest to military strategists. You see, while Mueller was working out the properties of DDT, there was something else going on in Europe in the 1940s, World War II. War and disease often go hand in hand, and this war was no exception. In Europe, the squalid and crowded conditions of concentration camps and barracks made the spread of lice-carrying typhus all too easy. And in the Pacific theater, malaria was a persistent and seemingly uncontrollable problem that could incapacitate troops just as easily as enemy bullets, and often more frequently. DDT was brought to bear against these problems with remarkable success, starting in 1942. Allied forces in particular made use of the chemical, shipping tons of the stuff to the war front where it was sprayed as a powder on people's skin. Any lice that landed on a person doused in DDT would quickly die, and because it was so stable, the chemical could protect a person for days if not weeks. The result was that outbreaks of typhus could be squashed quite effectively, Pleased with the success of the chemical on the European front, Winston Churchill endorsed the chemical on public radio in 1944, stating, quote, The excellent DDT powder, which had been fully experimented with and found to yield astonishing results, will henceforth be used on a great scale by the British forces in Burma and by the American and Australian forces in the Pacific and India in all theaters, unquote. DDT was dumped by plane on the landscapes around military bases to kill any breeding mosquitoes and their larvae, and the result was a drastic decrease in mosquito populations with a corresponding dramatic decrease in malaria cases among the allied forces. Clearly DDT was doing amazing things and saving lives, so when World War II was over, governments decided to keep the ball rolling. Here's how it went down in the United States. In 1946, the U.S. Public Health Service formed a small new branch of their organization called the Communicable Disease Center. This organization now goes by the name Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC for short. The CDC at its birth was given a single task, stop the spread of malaria in the United States. Malaria was an endemic disease in the southeastern United States, and there were thousands of deaths every year from the disease. To put themselves in the best position to organize a national effort to eradicate malaria, the CDC set up its headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, a region with particularly high malaria rates. After months of planning, the operation commenced in July of 1947. DDT was used to systematically spray houses and communities with high rates of malaria, which sometimes involved dropping the chemical from planes over whole neighborhoods. By the end of the campaign, nearly 5 million homes had been sprayed with DDT, and the effect was seen almost immediately. In 1949, 
just two years after they began spraying, the CDC declared the country malaria-free, and by 1952, the program was ended. To this day, malaria is no longer considered endemic in the United States. That is to say, there are almost no cases of locally acquired malaria on the continental United States. This was an astounding effect, and success stories like this one and others from around the world put Mueller in full view of the Nobel Assembly. In 1948, despite not being a physician and without any background in the medical sciences, Mueller was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So what happened after that? Where are we at with DDT nowadays? Well, given the enormous success DDT had in clearing malaria from the US, one might have expected the world to be malaria-free by now. Well, DDT certainly continued to be used widely in the control of mosquitoes and other pests. Its effectiveness was such that in 1970, the US National Academy of Sciences issued a statement about DDT that stated, quote, it is estimated that in little more than two decades, DDT has prevented 500 million deaths due to malaria that would otherwise have been inevitable, unquote. However, just two years after this statement, the U.S. would finalize a complete ban on the use of DDT, and many European countries were following suit. So what happened? Well, the first thing that happened was people began realizing insects could develop resistance to DDT, which made spraying it less effective at controlling pests. The second and more remarkable thing that happened was Rachel Carson and her book Silent Spring. Rachel Carson was a biologist who worked for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Although her main duties at the Bureau were monitoring and reporting on fish populations, it quickly became apparent that she had a flair for writing. She wrote articles for local newspapers and published books popularizing the natural sciences. Then in 1962, she published her manifesto, a book called Silent Spring. In the book, Carson reported on the growing evidence that DDT and its derivatives were having a surprising but dramatic negative impact on the environment, particularly on insect, bird, and fish populations. She reported how areas sprayed with DDT to eliminate one particular pest, like say the fire ant or mosquito, would result in the elimination of not just the pests, but most of the insects in the area. How could this be? Well, this involves two properties of DDT, specifically numbers 5 and 6 on the list of conditions Mueller had for his insecticide. Number 5 was that the range of action of the insecticide should cover as many different types of insects as possible, and number 6 was that the insecticide be long-lasting, i.e. have good chemical stability. DDT had both of these properties, which made it a great insecticide, and also made it the easy solution to a wide range of problematic insects. However, it also made it terrible for the environment. Its non-selective manner meant that when it was sprayed over wide areas, it would kill all the insects, not just the pests that were the real target. This was something that people didn't really care much about at first. Most people thought all bugs were bad and needed to be out of the way for crops to grow. But this isn't true. Insects like bumblebees are extremely important for pollinating plants, including many important crops. And there are many insect species that help maintain the right balance of nutrients in soil to help plants grow. So the loss of the insects had an impact on the overall health of the soil and negatively impacted the plants. But DDT was also drastically reducing local bird and fish populations, sometimes reducing their numbers by 99%. When scientists did autopsies on the dead animals, they found shockingly high concentrations of DDT in their bodies. Sometimes the concentration of DDT was over a hundred times the threshold of toxicity to the animals. This was most unexpected. Experiments in labs had already shown that birds and other animals sprayed with DDT remained healthy, and laws were already in place to limit the amount of sprayed DDT to well below levels known to be toxic to animals. So what was going on? 
Well, this goes back to the fact that DDT is an incredibly stable chemical, and also that it is fat soluble. So when humans dumped DDT all over the place, the insects would absorb the DDT on contact and die. But then fish or birds would come and eat the dead DDT laden insects. Since DDT is fat soluble, it would be stored in the fat tissue of the animals. And the more insects the animal ate, the more concentrated DDT became in the fat tissue. Then when winter came and the animals began drawing on their fat reserves, all that DDT would be released in an incredibly high dose, enough to kill the animal. Some bird species were more tolerant and wouldn't die of the poison themselves, but the DDT would be deposited in the fat stores of their eggs, which would kill the chicks or weaken the shells. And the effect didn't have to come directly from the poisoned insects. DDT could be passed up the food chain from the insects to the fish and then from the fish to the birds that ate the fish. One species that was hit hard by the contaminated fish was the bald eagle, which by the 1950s was threatened with extinction. The resulting loss of wild birds was staggering to bird watchers and professional scientists alike. And Carson was quick to point out the devastation in her book. In the opening chapter of Silent Spring, she invites the reader to picture a typical American town in April or May, except in this town, there are no sounds of crickets or cicadas, no sounds of robins or sparrows or songbirds, no sound of wildlife at all, a town where spring has come, but spring is silent. Well, that's pretty alarming. And the rest of the book is also very alarmist. At one point, Carson compares crop dusting to nuclear fallout. That kind of language is almost certainly an exaggeration, but it got people's attention. Many who read the book were shocked by its contents, and as more people became familiar with it, a growing movement began in the United States to limit the use of DDT and its derivatives. This was the birth of the modern environmentalist movement. The movement made its way all the way to Washington, D.C., which culminated in the creation of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the federal entity tasked with enforcing laws directed at protecting the environment. One of the first cases taken up by the EPA was DDT, which was officially banned by the agency in 1972. The chemical that had boomed so quickly onto the global scene had gone bust in just a few decades. Now the use of DDT and its derivatives didn't stop all at once. There was a lot of pushback, as people worried that limiting its use would affect the food supply and lead to an increase in insect-borne diseases. Now this is one of those kind of tricky ethical issues that comes up in science more than we might guess. The question might be stated like this. In our efforts to support human flourishing, how much damage to the environment is considered acceptable? It's a difficult question, and people are going to disagree about the answer. But when faced with a challenge like this, I think what everyone would like is a way to support both. A way to maximize human well-being while doing as little damage as possible to the environment. And if a new method turns out to be a problem, like in the case of DDT, then we can work to find a new way to accomplish our goals. Carson puts it like this in her book, quote, We must make wider use of alternative methods and devote our ingenuity and resources to developing others, unquote. I think that's totally the right answer, and many scientists have been working on developing those new methods that achieve the goal of controlling the spread of insect-borne diseases without the collateral damage to the environment. And I want to end today's podcast by highlighting a couple of them. The main problem with insecticides like DDT is that they are toxic not just to the species you are trying to eliminate, like say the mosquito, but to other insects as well. So scientists have been developing strategies that specifically target the mosquito while leaving the other insects alone. We went over one of these methods in episode 2 of this podcast, where we talked about gene drive technologies that can eliminate mosquito populations. But scientists have taken it one step further, killing all the mosquitoes, even if it's only the mosquitoes, might still have a negative impact on the environment. 
I know lots of you listening might be totally okay with eliminating all the mosquitoes, but they are a source of food for many different species. They're a critical part of many food webs. So if your goal is stopping the mosquito from spreading disease, is there a way you could target the pathogen in the mosquito without killing the mosquito? Well, yes, there is. The first way is to use a bacteria called Wolbachia. A really cool finding turned up about 15 years ago in the scientific literature. Scientists reported that insects infected with a bacterium called Wolbachia were significantly less able to spread human viruses like dengue, zika, and chikungunya. When the Wolbachia are present in the mosquito, the bacteria puts the insect cells in a state that directly prevents virus replication. Scientists have tried releasing Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes as a way to prevent dengue virus, and the largest trial of this kind finished last year in Indonesia. The result was a 77% reduction in dengue cases in areas that got the Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes compared to the controls. That's really good. More plants with Wolbachia are in the works, so keep an eye out for news on that. A second really cool strategy that is still in its early stages came out in January of last year. This strategy was developed in Dr. Omar Akbari's lab, formerly at UC Riverside and now over at UC San Diego. The team used a really cool molecular technique called CRISPR to genetically engineer mosquitoes so that they would express an antibody fragment that neutralizes the dengue virus. They basically genetically engineered the mosquitoes to be resistant to dengue. Really cool, right? <laughs> the work still has a long way to go before it enters field trials, but I'm going to keep my eye on it to see where it goes. But with both of these methods, the goal of eliminating the disease is achieved without any damage to humans or the environment. And if people continue to put their heads together and to do experiments, I'm sure there's going to be even more amazing discoveries in the future. So that concludes this 12th episode of Notable Nobels. This episode was recorded on September 22nd, 2021. I want to thank Digital Mind Productions for providing the music. Next time on Notable Nobels, we will be entering the very exciting world of viruses and vaccines, which you all have heard quite a bit about in the news recently. But maybe you haven't heard much about the history of vaccines. We'll be going over the only Nobel Prize to date awarded specifically for a virus vaccine. Any guesses which vaccine it was? Well, listen next time to find out. Thanks so much for listening. See you then.